Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Freebus UBI workshop. Today we have, uh, oh, I didn't, I didn't check everybody's uh, uh, name pronunciation. We have Anna Ustendorp and Johan Gutzmann uh, will be giving a joint presentation. Uh, and so I will turn it over you to begin. Right, uh, thank you, Carl. Thank you. Um, nice to meet you all. Just give me a second to start my uh, screen sharing. There you go. So just as a check, you should all see my presentation now, right? Okay, perfect. So also uh, from me and from Anna, welcome everybody. My name is Johan Gutzma, as Carl already said. And today my colleague Anna Ausnop and I are going to talk about how an unconditional cash transfer can increase political participation by building trust. More specifically, we're going to talk about a exclusive study that investigated whether receiving an unconditional cash transfer as part of unemployment benefits increases the intention to vote among long-term unemployed Finnish citizens. Furthermore, we're not going, or we're not only going to show you the findings of the study, we are also going to show you or elaborate on the mechanism or one of the psychological mechanisms that underlie this effect. But before we do so, please allow us to introduce ourselves quickly. Anna and I are both experts at the Stiftung Grundeinkommen, which is a Munich and Berlin-based think tank that explores um, the transformation of the German social system towards a more universal social system. And we do that by adopting an evidence-based um, slash evidence-informed perspective. Anna's and my main areas of expertise are social psychology, psychology of motivation, and work and organization psychology. So uh, I'm pretty sure you can tell that Anna and I are both psychologists. And psychology will also be somewhat of the focus of our presentation today. So we, of course, will be talking about the findings um, of the study, but we will also maybe even more so elaborate on the psychological mechanism that drives these effects. Um, generally, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them during the presentation. You can also save them for later because I understood that there will be time for discussion as well. Okay. So at Stiftung Grundeinkommen, we are currently, among other things, interested in exploring the potential of basic income for building and strengthening democracy, motivating civic engagement, and strengthening social cohesion. And when I say, or when we say basic income, um, as a short disclaimer to begin with, we basically mean every related policy that falls under this umbrella term. We are aware of the sometimes very contentious debate about the labeling, but for us, at least, within the context of this presentation. When we say basic income, we basically mean everything that falls under this. Yeah, and we are in particular interested in the relationship between basic income or basic income related and inspired policies and political participation and especially electoral turnout. And this is because uh, political participation has been declining in Germany. It has been quite high in the 70s, but since uh, the 1980s, electoral turnout has been declining in all kinds of elections. So in parliamentary elections, but also in state elections or European elections, there's been this decline. And that by itself would not be as big as an issue, but uh, in addition, there's uh, also a socioeconomic gap in voting turnout. So this decline is especially pronounced among citizens with low socioeconomic status. And you can see that nicely in those figures. So in, in the left um, figure, you can see that the electoral turnout among people with high income, which is um, the upper gray line is much higher than the turnout of people with medium or lower income. And on the right, in the right graph, you can see that uh, people who are unemployed, that is the, that's the, the red line at the bottom, 
have a much lower turnout than people who are employed or retired. And here, the difference in the end um, in 2018 is the biggest difference. It's um, more than uh, 35 percentage points, which is a lot. And we also um, find this socioeconomic gap in our own research. We looked at um, the latest elections in, in Germany, the state elections, which took place in May of this year in Schleswig-Holstein and Nordrhein-Westfalen, and we correlated uh, the turnout um, across counties and those states with the official unemployment rate and the mean income per capita in those counties. And on the left, there's uh, you can see the unemployment rate and you can see a negative correlation between turnout and unemployment rate, meaning that the higher the unemployment rate, the lower the turnout. And on the right, you can see a positive correlation between income and turnout. So the higher the income, the higher the turnout. So um, there are obviously many different reasons for this socioeconomic gap in voter turnout. One very um, big reason, very important reason is social context. We know from psychological research, but also from sociological research that uh, the voting norm among people or citizens with low SES is not particularly strong, meaning that people from the segment of society tend to not view voting as a civic duty, nor is it very common for them or their friends or acquaintances to go out and vote. So voting is just simply nothing that you would normally do in um, or among a lot of um, people with low SES. Also, we know that there's very little interest in politics, which has to do with another uh, reason for the socioeconomic gap in voter turnout, which is the feeling of being left behind, which is, I think, nicely summarized, summarized by the uh, quote, don't play if you can't win. And that illustrates the idea that, at least subjectively, a lot of people with a low socioeconomic status tend to believe that their preferences, their interests are not um, or that the politicians um, and the political process and the political decision making tends to neglect their preferences and interests. So for them, it feels like a rational choice not to engage with the political process because after all, the voice seemingly is not heard. Um, finally, there's also a big literature on the effects of cognitive load um, that the experience of financial strain puts on a person. So we know, again from social psychological research that if you experience poverty, relative poverty, or even just financial worries, you, are, you have less cognitive resources at your disposal, you have less time, there are a lot of practical constraints you experience, and all these factors, all these constraints together um, do not leave much space cognitively and practically to think about politics and engage with the political process. So there are a number of reasons that account for the socioeconomic gap, but of course, um, the big question is, why should we care? After all, you know, we could just say it's simply an observation that we have. Now, the reason why the socioeconomic gap in voting turnout is so um, problematic is that the interests of citizens with low SES are underrepresented in political decision making. It shouldn't come as a surprise that generally speaking, political decisions are made with the voters' preferences. And we know from research that preference of voters and non-voters are simply not the same. So for instance, non-voters tend to prefer redistributive policies much more strongly than voters do. And you know, if you keep in mind that a lot of non-voters are also people of low socioeconomic status, um, it's easily conceivable that the preferences of these citizens tends to be neglected in the decision-making process. And that leads to somewhat of a vicious cycle. Yeah? Um, if the preferences are neglected, that creates the feeling of being left behind, which in turn fosters withdrawal from the uh, political process, which leads to less voting turnout, and then actually the neglect of the preferences, and so on and so forth. How can we reduce this gap? Um, one potential lever is the social security system. Because we know 
from uh, previous research that welfare policies can influence voting turnout. Both uh, universal and unconditional welfare policies have been found to increase turnout, possibly by signaling responsiveness and inclusion. So basically telling that um, your preferences, your interests matter to us. Also, welfare policies are the touch point with um, the target group. Uh, the social security system is the governmental institution. Citizens with low SES are most likely to interact with. And from psychological research on effective interventions, we know that interventions are then especially effective if we focus on the target group and if we focus on the underlying psychological mechanisms. Therefore, it makes a lot of sense to look at the potential of welfare policies as a means for increasing uh, voting turnout and strengthening democratic engagement. So against this background, we asked ourselves, does basic income inspired social security systems have the potential to increase political participation among citizens with low socioeconomic status? Yeah, and to explore this question further, we were very lucky um, to work with Salomon Giromaniana, who are three researchers from Munich and Finland. And the Stiftung Grundeinkommen was able to fund their research on uh, data from the Finnish basic income experiment, which was um, a government initiated um, field experiment on an unconditional cash transfer, which took place in Finland in 2017 and 18. And um, just as a short um, disclaimer, before we continue uh, talking about the data, um, Johan and I, or the Stiftung Grundeinkommen, we were not the principal investigators in the study. Um, that was Salomon, Jerome, and Jana. So um, we are still very happy to talk about the data and to present them to you. But um, if, we, if you have very interest, intricate questions, very specific questions about the mythology, we might not be able to answer them. And we might have to refer to um, those, uh, to Jerome and his colleagues for that. But yeah, but I think we're fine to go for all the other questions. So continuing with the data and zooming in. The, thank you. So just a little bit background on the Finnish basic income experiment. All participants in, all participants in the experiment were unemployed at the start uh, of the experiment. The treatment group were 2000 randomly selected um, Finnish citizens who received unemployment um, benefits and um, the control group was um, also for, were also um, unemployed um, people in Finland. Um, the treatment group received um, the usual unemployment benefit, which was 560 euros, um, with the difference that they received this income without any conditions, so they didn't have to apply for a job, um, there was nothing. They, there was nothing they had to do in return for this money. And also, a second difference is that even if they started a job within the duration of the experiment, within those two years, um, this income was not reduced by their earned income. So when they started a job, they could keep both this um, the finished income as well as their earned income for the duration of those of the, for the duration of the experiment. So there are two big differences between the treatment and the control group. And now continuing. Um, the researchers um, accessed the survey data um, that was collected within this experiment, within towards the end of the experiment. And in total, there were uh, almost 1,600 people that participated. Okay, so the main outcome of interest for the Finnish government was actually um, to look at effects on employment. But our main outcome of interest was to look at effects on vote intention in the upcoming elections or back then the upcoming elections. And there were other um, interesting outcomes that we looked at, um, especially trust was very interesting to us and we will talk a bit about it later on. So uh, the researchers performed a linear regression. Um, they controlled um, for several variables. In, in, an important note is um, that uh, they conducted the analysis um, for three groups um, separately. Um, as it is common within voting 
uh, literature on voting um, behavior. Um, there are three different groups of people. So those who are very unlikely to vote, those who sometimes vote and sometimes, sometimes they don't, and those who are very likely to vote all the time. So the research is formed um, through groups based um, based on these properties and, and they, they were based on stable correlates of voting like education or age. And the effects were ex expected to be most prominent among those so-called marginal voters, because here we expect um, their behavior to be the most malleable. All right, so before I'm going to show you the results, um, again, a short disclaimer, I'm, on, I'm, I'm only going to show you the results for uh, our main outcome of interest, which was intention to vote, and for one of the other outcomes of interest, which is trust in parliament. Um, we do that just for the sake of time. If you're interested in the other results, we prepared additional slides, so feel free to ask us at the end of our presentation if you want to see the effects on internal political efficacy, stress, or interpersonal trust. So without further ado, here are the results. So we find that receiving an unconditional cash transfer increases the intention to vote um, for marginal voters by 7.3 um, percentage points, um, which is, um, if you look at the get out the vote literature, quite a decent effect size, even though at first glance it might seem, you know, rather marginal, but in fact, it's, it's pretty large. Um, as expected, we do not find any significant effects of the treatment for people with a low propensity to vote and for people with a very high propensity to vote. If you're interested in the numbers, I'll briefly zoom in. Here you can see um, the results of the regression. I'm not going to go into that, um, I'll just, you know, Give you a couple of seconds to screen over that since in the interest of time i'm going to continue with the second result um trust in parliament we here see that receiving an unconditional cash transfer increases trust in parliament um, for both people with a low propensity to vote and for marginal voters but not for people with a high propensity to vote again i quickly zoom in um, into the uh, results from the regression, regression analysis What's interesting here maybe is that we see that there's an overall effect of the treatment, which is um, primarily driven by people with low propensity to vote and by marginal voters, not so much by high propensity voters who seem to have a very high trust in parliament to begin with. What might be also interesting to note is that there is no difference between um, low propensity voters and marginal voters in terms of the uh, effect of the intervention. So both for low propensity voters and for marginal voters, um, the uh, basic income treatment or the unconditional cash flow treatment um, increase trust, trust comparably strongly. Sorry, um, here we go. So these are the results. Um, of course, there are a number of limitations that we want to uh, draw your attention to. First of all, intention to vote is not actual voting behavior. We are very aware of that. And we know from psychological research that there is a considerable gap between intervention, uh, between intention and behavior. Meaning that only because someone has the intention to do something does not necessarily mean that he or she is going to do it. Um, also, we see empirically that actual voter turnout is typically lower than the levels of voting intentions measured prior to any election. Yet, even though this is certainly a limitation, um, intention to vote is still a valid predictor of actual voting behavior, albeit, or albeit maybe not the strongest. What we are at liberty to say though, and that's why I just hesitated a bit because I was thinking whether we can actually say it, but I think we can. Um, our study is part of a larger study conducted by Jan Jerome and Salomo, um, and there they looked at actual voting behavior, at the registry data for the voting um, in Finnish elections. And even though the results have not been published yet, I think it's, it's okay for us to say that um, it looks like as if these results, the actual voting behavior results, do not contradict what we find with regard to intention to vote. 
Another limitation, of course, is that uh, the treatment was not entirely unconditional, which means that uh, people in the treatment group um, could or had to apply for other social benefits that were conditional. So within the treatment group, there were people who experienced full unconditionality and other people experienced partly in, or in partly unconditional social system. The other uh, limitation is that the treatment was not entirely means test free, meaning again, that uh, there were some job seekers who could or had to apply for benefits that were indeed means tested. So the treatment was neither fully unconditional nor entirely means test free. Uh, last limitation that we didn't put down here, but which we think warrants mentioning is that um, as Anna already told you when she briefly talked about the uh, methodological setup of the Finnish basic income experiment, there are two potential causes for any difference between the group. One is partly unconditionality. The other one is um, the work incentive. Uh, if you remember, people in the uh, treatment group were allowed to keep the 560 euros they received unconditionally, even if they found a job within the two year period. So um, that of course is a threat to any internal validity of any experiment. So we cannot be entirely sure whether our effect on voting attention and trust is really due to unconditionality and not due to um, uh, work incentives or a combination of both. But um, as Anna will tell you later on, I think, uh, there is a lot of evidence to believe, both from our data and from other research as well, that it's um, specifically the unconditionality that drives this effect. Okay, so to sum it up, um, we find in uh, the study that unconditional cash transfer increases the intention to vote. And we also find that unconditional cash transfer increases trust in Parliament. For those of you who are somewhat familiar with uh, statistical path models, you'll see that that basically looks like a mediation um, analysis or mediation process. Um, and all it lacks basically is the, the arrow from trust in parliament to voting intention. Now, we didn't put it down here because in our data, we did not um, look at a mediation effect or put more precisely, um, the researchers did not look at a mediation effect, mainly because of methodological constraints in the data having to do with when the data were collected. But we know from other research that trust in parliament does increase voting intention. So there's a lot of evidence to assume that trust in parliament is indeed the mediator, the mechanism behind the effect of unconditional trust, cash transfer on political participation in general and voting intention in particular. And that's why for the remainder of this presentation, we want to focus on this mechanism. Okay, so let's take a, a little bit closer look at the topic of trust for the rest of the presentation. Um, first of all, what is trust? Trust is, um, in general, the willingness to be vulnerable to someone else's actions based on positive expectation about the other's behavior. So it has two components. The first is the vulner vulnerability, and the second is the positive expectations about the behavior, which means uh, not only expectation, the expectation that someone else is capable of doing something, but um, more specifically, the expectations, the expectation that someone else will act in my interest, or at least will not against, will not act against my interest. So it's uh, an expectation of goodwill. And individual trust in institutions or trust in politics. Uh, has been is associated in general with a general general um, willingness to uh, to cooperate with authorities, a general um, con willingness to contribute to society. For example, it has been found that it, it correlates with willingness to pay taxes, and as we just said, it correlates with voter turnout. While political distrust um, correlates with beliefs in populist opinions and beliefs in conspiracy myths. And trust in other people is usually 
uh, usually forms an index of the share of citizens who generally trust other people. So it's often um, measured as an index of a trust climate of a country. And this trust climate of a country has been found to be um, associated with all kinds of, of positive outcomes, like freedom from corruption, better infrastructure, better education, literacy, um, health variables, economic growth. Um, yeah, all kinds of positive outcomes. So as you can see that both trust in institutions as well as a trust climate and trust in others um, are, are important for the success and also for the resilience of a society. And we know that in, in times like these today, a resilient um, society is very important when we face the challenges like the pandemic, war, and uh, global warming and so forth. So trust being so important, how did the Finnish basic income policy manage to increase trust in the recipients? So as you had already said, we, we don't know for certain which factor in the policy may have increased the trust, but as literature and theory suggests, it's probably the unconditionality of that policy. Because we know that in, in conditional welfare states where non-cooperative behavior is sanctioned, there's usually, it's usually associated with a, a certain arbitrariness because there's an individual person that has to make a judgment call on whether a sanction is justified or not. And there's usually more conflict and need for, a, a, felt need for secrecy or for self-protection in the interaction between the recipient and the public official administering um, that sanction. And in, a, in an unconditional system, all of this is much less likely. So we, we don't have this in an unconditional system. And on the other hand, um, in an unconditional system, the unconditionality may signal um, a sign of responsiveness or care from the authority. So recipients might feel much more included or heard, and that might lead to a circle of a cycle of co cooperation instead of distrust. And these findings or these reasonings um, fit very well with what we know from the literature on what features of policies and institutions increase trust. So in other research, we see that anything that promotes fairness or justice in a policy or in an institution will also promote trust. For example, if it's a, um, a policy that increases um, freedom from corruption, a policy that's not arbitrary, that um, leads to equal treatment, so nobody's, uh, nobody's um, receiving any um, different treatment based on, for example, social background and so forth. Also, and especially universal and welfare policies have been found to increase trust while means-tested policies decrease it, decrease it. And that is possibly also true, also due to um, the fact that universal policies are less arbitrary and more fair than means-tested policies. And thirdly, anything that makes the public official an ally instead of an opponent to the recipient uh, will increase trust. So anything that that decreases that need for self-protection or that decreases that dog-eat-dog -dog mentality um, that welfare policies often have. And finally, um, any feature of a policy that might remedy or that might um, compensate uh, inequality will probably increase trust. So anything that, that helps against inequality of opportunities, for example, will increase trust. Okay, so when we look at these features um, more from a basic income inspired lens, um, we, can, yeah, we can look at guiding features that all kinds of basic income policies and basic income inspired policies have in common. And we can see that there's a quite a, a lot of overlap. So usually basic income policies would also aim at reducing arbitrariness. They would 
try to promote equal treatment and transparency. And that's very probably would lead to a more fair and just um, policy. Also by definition or by at least many definitions of basic income include this aspect of universalism and also unconditionality, which is um, also a key a criterion in the definition of all basic income policies. So that would um, probably lead to more cooperation and make um, the public official uh, more of an ally instead of an opponent to the recipient. And finally, many basic income policies um, would aim at fostering equal opportunities and even aim at redistribution. So that might increase equality and thus also lead to trust. So in conclusion, in the face of the challenges that we, we face today, we need a resilient society and a resilient society is a society in which citizens are trusting and trustworthy and in which institutions are trusting and trustworthy and that has a resilient democracy as well. And as we saw today, the design of welfare policies might be a lever to promote both trust and the political participation in society. Thank you. All right, thank you both. Thank you. Uh, could you uh, uh, turn off your screen share so we can uh, the, see well the faces of all the panel members? Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Now I would like to bring on uh, our discussant, uh, Arita Domi, uh, who's going to give some initial reactions and get us going uh, on today's discussion. Arita, can you hear me? Uh, unmute and give me some video. Um, I can unmute, but for some reason it says that I cannot start the video because the host has... Okay. No, you can. Okay. <laughs> Um, hello. Uh, okay, so I have a few questions, um, but before I start, um, I just wanted to say that um, I found it interesting that you found significant results on the marginal votes, and I think um, those results are quite meaningful, and there's a lot to unpack there um, with future studies. Um, there's another thing I liked in the study, and um, you mentioned that uh, there are two income participation gaps, and one was reflecting the inequality in current income, and then another was reflecting unequal opportunities in real life and early life. And um, you also mentioned a study um, about the Native American casinos and uh, how, um, and that provided uh, some support on the long-term benefits of a basic income system, um, which um, was interesting to hear, especially with the results of the paper. Um, so starting with a couple of questions, um, I know you said uh, there's, you did not design the, the um, methods, but I had just a quick question and it's okay if, um, yeah. It, it was about the, how you decided to calculate the probability of intending to vote. And I was wondering why it was this way and why not asking or surveying people if they voted um, beforehand or a, a different way? So that is a very good question. And that was one of the questions we intensively discussed um, with the researchers as well, because there are many different ways to calculate propensity scores. Um, there are mm -hmm. different methods for these propensity scores. Um, so in short, what, what we can say, and you know, for more detailed answer, we have to refer you to the principal investigators, unfortunately, but what we can say is that um, they, they, they used the data that was collected as part of the Finnish basic income experiment. And there they simply didn't ask do you intend to vote? Because yep. you're right, it would make a lot of sense just to simply ask how <laughs> likely is it that you're going to vote in the next election. But they couldn't, so they used um, a propensity score model from the voting literature, from the get out of the vote literature, um, in, in order to calculate who is a marginal voter, who is a low propensity voter and a high propensity voter. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. 
Okay. Um, I can move on with my second question, um, if that's okay. And um, this was more about the, the marginal voters. Um, and in, at one point, um, you say that uh, these voters are more willing to vote in, in important elections, but they're not they're not voting in uh, municipality elections or um, smaller elections. And I was wondering how your result plays with th this definition or are there other factors of marginal voters that is making them have these significant results other than this? And if they're voting more, are they voting more on municipality elections or is it just an increase in proportion of how much they vote in, in more bigger elections? Um, well, it's for sure that usually the turnout is slower on municipal elections than parliamentary elections. And we know that, in, for example, in parliamentary elections, much more people vote. So that would be one factor um, in that. So probably the marginal voters might vote at parliamentary elections too, but they might not vote at other kinds of elections. But it's also other um, factors like age, anything that we know that um, has to do with the likelihood to vote. Um, if I may add. Um, sure. So your decision to vote is influenced by a lot of factors. Um, one, for instance, being trust in parliament, other being just your background, um, but also whether sort of the, the issues that are being um, discussed matter to you or not. So to your question, um, and that's just my gut feeling, so I'm not speaking for the authors of the, of the paper here, I'm just, you know, from my reading of the paper and my understanding of the literature, I'd say that you probably see the increase, um, especially in elections that are important to those uh, marginal voters. Um, you'd probably see it more pronounced there than if there's an election which is not um, so important to them or to the issues they are concerned about. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that makes sense. And, and um, it would be a, a good addition to the literature if it could be explored further, because I think it's an important result to um, if it's increasing votes in the parliamentary elections. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I can... Oh, um... Uh, it sounded like you were done, Ariza. Do you have more? Because I, I have something. I have something that I wanted to say. If you, uh, um, but you have more. Yeah, I have one more question. If that's okay. Okay, go on. Okay. Um, I just uh, just one sentence at the end that says that this could be more replicable and more established democracies. Um, do you have anything to add on that? On why only established democracies or? Um, Um, so I'm, I'm not sure which sentence, but I, I can say something about the effects on established dem democracy versus uh, newer democracy. So all, all these effects like on trust and on turnout, all these effects that we know in literature usually are, are from more stable democracy. So they might be different in, in newer uh, democracies and also in, in other kinds of regimes like autocratic regimes, anything like that, the results of the findings might be a bit different in those. Okay, I would like to sort of react, uh, react here more than a question. Is this, I think this is like uh, a, a, a lesson for people who are interested in basic income and, uh, and aren't always interested in, in in statistics, because this is this something that sounds like such a small, tedious little study. Oh, did they vote more in Finland? That thing. But actually, you ask that little question, and you get these enormous implications of this question. Is that uh, we're just looking at the correlation of 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 UBI and voting, but 
being able to interpret this about trust in my fellow citizens and in the government of the society that I live in. Uh, and this really hits me because this is really the exact type of thing that my philosophy predicts that we spend so much time trying to get the less privileged to prove to us that they're worthy of our help, that they need to jump through this hoop and that hoop and the other hoop to earn our trust, and then we will help them. And, and the way they earn our trust is typically to work for us. Oh, you underprivileged person, get a job and work for a more privileged person. Then we will trust you. Then we'll know you're a good person. Then, oh, we will surely help you. But, but often uh, in countries where we do that, we actually help uh, the less advantaged less. And when you do this, you create a culture of distrust. We think about what, what do they have to do to earn our trust? And we never think of what do we have to do to earn their trust. But of course, if you have a society that is divided into the privileged and the, those with very little privilege or, and, and distinctly out groups, it is the people with privilege who really need to earn the trust of the others. If you want to build a trusting society, it, 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 it begins by, by those who have privilege earning the trust of those who have the least, and this, I believe, is most effectively done with unconditional aid to the people who need it the most. Um, and I think uh, Finland, uh, Finland and countries like Finland are already farther in that direction than a lot of other countries, but this shows that they've got, they've got further to go. Uh, that's not a question, uh, but that's just my reaction. Maybe you two would like to react to my reaction. Yeah, I think it's very true to be trusted. You need to prove that you're trustworthy. So that's that's just so linked. Trust and tr trustworthiness can really not be separated up at all. So yeah, I think this is the most important um, most important component of trust is to create a trustworthiness. So I and it's also like fostering a trusting society. Uh, you foster a trust society by we start out by trusting you, whereas uh, where I live, we live in such a very suspicious society, um, and, and and it's a climate of, of of fear and anger. I think it, it, it is what it fosters. Yeah, I think it rings very true what you're saying, um, especially if you just look um, through a sort of very sort of impartial lens on the mechanisms underlying that. What we see is that people with low SES disengage from politics because they feel that their preferences are not um, considered well enough. And they do feel that in part, as the data shows and other research shows as well, because they um, feel that they're distrusted. They feel that they have to jump through all the hoops to show that, and they don't feel that we as a society, the, um, the social institutions that we have are responsive to their needs. So just simply from a practical point of view, um, I think it makes a lot of sense to first ask how can we increase their trust in us in the societal institution, mm -hmm. other than asking how can they increase our trust in them. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And uh, it's great to see some evidence that that well that what I've suspected here is act is actually true that that UBI fosters trust. So I think it's it's a really it's it, it's a result that that uh, is much bigger than it sounds. And like well we're going to look at voting uh, UBI and voting sounds so small. Uh, now I do have we have two audiences here. We have one audience of the 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 Freebus team. The, the Freiburg Institute for Basic Income Studies, our, our local team uh, in Freiburg uh, is on Zoom and they can ask questions out loud, uh, such as Arita. But we also have another audience on YouTube uh, who don't have the same ability to interact, but, but they're leaving comments. And I do have a question in the YouTube comment that I think is a little bit of a tangent, a little bit tangential to this research. But let's go to it anyway. And I'll, I, uh, it's also, when people are writing comments, they're usually writing very, just very quickly. So it might need some interpretation. There's two questions here. This is from uh, 
Sham Sadin Amanov. Sham Sadin Amanov, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, which I'm sure I'm not. Uh, and the question is, two questions here. How to deal with insincere promises regarding income, regarding basic income by political parties to gain more votes? Then the second sentence is, is the independent basic income institution a solution? So now the first question, yeah, I don't know if my interpretation of these questions is anybody, but the first one about, uh, about um, insincere promises is, uh, could be two things. Uh, one could be that politicians will say, I'm gonna introduce basic income in order to get votes, or I'm gonna introduce basic income in order to get votes and then not do it. But another thing could be that some things like this, some things like, well, a lot of people are talking about basic income. I, it's very expensive to introduce a basic income. I'll just give them this little experiment instead. We'll do this experiment instead of, of uh, introducing basic income. And all the people who support basic income should vote for me just because I, I, I had this little cheap experiment. Uh, I'm not sure if that's what is meant. Then the second question, is the independent basic income institution a solution? Uh, well, they have, they have something like this in Alaska and Norway, where money goes into a fund and then is distributed directly to the people, and it is monitored on an independent basis, and there's a limited amount that politicians can change it on, on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, in Norway, that's used just for pensions, but the pensions actually work similar to a basic income once you reach a certain age, whereas in, in Alaska, it works more like uh, a basic income, but it's also much lower. Uh, so it, you get everybody in the whole state, if, if they prove they're a resident, gets it. I think he's talking, the question here is talking about things like this, but how do you answer those two questions? Well, um, I, I have to cop out a bit, unfortunately, yeah. because I'm no politician. I'm mm -hmm. first and foremost a psychologist and scientist who is um, not that invested in the political dimension of basic income. I'm much more interested in the uh, scientific dimension of basic income mm -hmm. and the effects on behavior and attitudes of citizens and society in general. Um, so what I say is that um, what politicians do and say is, you know, powering moves. They do that to build coalitions, to get votes. Um, but I think that um, one way to deal with false promises, maybe, or grandiose promises by politicians is to have a, um, a receptory of evidence-based information about basic income. What can basic mm -hmm. income do? What can't it do? Mm -hmm. So, you know, and what is maybe also politically possible within um, a given society, within a given political system with the different power dynamics at play. So that would help for the first part. And the second part, I think, um, why not? Yeah, it might make sense to have an independent body governing um, a fund distributed as a basic income, maybe also an independent body um, governing research efforts into mm -hmm. basic income as well. Mm -hmm. I, okay. I think yeah. I would add to the second part that still the government or the authorities would have to be a trustworthy entity. So it, it can't be an excuse to just do the basic income somehow else and then still have, have conditional and have arbitrary welfare policies by, by the state or by the government, I would say. I think it's a it's a big it's a big sign of responsiveness and care if the government gives out the basic in income or whatever similar policy yeah um i think um i i think one 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 lesson is is that is that progressive policies and, and greater democracy go hand in hand and it's the causality is in both directions uh, you find that the you find that the most democratic countries are also the countries that have the most equal outcomes in term in terms of wealth and income, and 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 a lot of that is driven by policy, and a lot of it is driven by is driven by other things. If somebody offers you, oh, make me an authoritarian, and then I'm going to have all sorts of distributive programs that are going to help you out, 
Uh, do not trust that person. Um, and, uh, and I think the more responsive the government is to the needs of the people, including the people who are the most marginalized, the more likely it is to move in the direction of things like, like UBI. And I think the Nordic countries, uh, their experience, they're not at UBI yet, but they're uh, so much far ahead of other, of, of other countries, um, both in terms of democracy and this, I think it's helpful. Okay, now I have another comment that I have not read in advance. This comes from Sarah Constantino. Uh, she says in the chat, she says, um, thank you for the talk. I found it very interesting. I have seen the competing hypothesis that a basic income would decrease political engagement as it might decrease interaction with the state. This may not have been the case in the, in the Finnish case, and as you point out, uh, it likely depends on what interaction is likely to begin with. In light of this, it was interesting to see your results. I unfortunately have to run. Okay, uh, so it's not so much question, but it is something to react to. Um, how rep reproducible do you think these results are gonna be across, uh, across a lot of other countries? And is there, is there, you know, the, the idea that basic income could cause us to become apathetic and, and, and just retreat. I've got my stuff. Uh, I've got my stuff. Um, how realistic do you find that? Well, I, I know that there's these, um, I know of two competing views on voting turnout, that there's mm -hmm. this other view that turnout might decrease when people are just happy and satisfied with anything and there would be just no need to go to an election because there's no need to change anything. And that actually turnout would increase when there's some pre pressing issues um, for the people. Um, as the researchers on our paper have explained to me is that this competing view is not like, usually it's the other way around. So usually it's more that in a, in a working successful democracy, people usually tend to, the turnout tends to be higher. Mm -hmm. So this yeah. is what I remember from, from what they explained to me. Well, we are not political scientists, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, Johan, you look like you want to get in there. <laughs> no, just as to the replicability of the findings, that's always difficult to say, um, especially if you look at cross-cultural comparisons. Um, the, makes it problematic anyways. Um, there will be um, a paper by the principal investigators looking at the registry data. I mean, it's still in Finland, it's the, it's the same participants, but it's a different dependent variable. Um, and as I've indicated, maybe the results go in the same direction. So that would be sort of, that would reproduce. Um, and to, to the comment, I think that uh, it really depends as the commentator already said herself, um, that uh, what, what's the, the baseline interaction like. So if you interact with the state or with social institutions and this interaction is primarily negative, you would expect withdrawal, right? I mean, that makes a lot of psychological sense. Now, if the interaction is very charitable, um, you find it very positive, decreasing this positive interaction might, you know, decrease your willingness to engage with the um, political system at large. But uh, seeing that trust is a um, multiple rounds game, I would say again, my gut feeling from, from the literature I know on trust, um, that that wouldn't be so much of an issue because trust is something that builds over time and um, you know once it's there it usually stays there. So even if you then decrease the amount of interactions you have with the state, you probably have the effects of trust at least on um, voting attention, for instance. Yeah, of course. Now also I need to point out that the, the number of people who vote is sometimes an indication of trust, but sometimes the indication of the, the very opposite. Um, yeah. I live Northern Ireland, during the height of the troubles in Northern Ireland had some of the highest voter turnout in the world for any country that did not have mandatory voting. Uh, and there they were not voting. <laughs> it was not any sign of trust in the system. It was uh, they were voting out of, uh, out of uh, hatred and distrust for the other side. So everybody on one side 
felt felt mm -hmm. uh, a, comp a compulsion to get out there and, and represent our side. And we've had some of that in the United States as trust has gone down between as the two parties have polarized and trust of a one, the one party by the other has gone down, actually voter participation has gone up. We've seen record high turnout. I think it was in 2016 when we had the highest turnout. Um, whereas if you look 20 years before that in 1996, when you had Bob Dole run against Bill Clinton, you're like, well, how different are these two candidates? A lot of people didn't bother. So, so sometimes trust will get you out there to participate and sometimes mistrust will get you out there to participate. And so the complexity of building an economy where people believe that, they're, that their participation is going to have an effect and they want to participate for the right reason, um, that's, actually, that's actually very difficult and, and very difficult and challenging. And it has to do with not just are we counting the votes fairly? But do we have a bunch of groups that are trying to work with each other um, and, and that, that trust that, that, well, we're going to count the votes and then, and then we're going to go with, with what the majority says? Just maybe as, as a last remark to what you say, just to, to be very clear, of course, we're not saying that trust is the only motivator to go out and vote. There are many other motivating factors as well. And sometimes it's contentious political issues that Trump... Uh, um, uh, trust, the way we think about um, trust, it's more of a context factor. So it's, it's bad for a society if there are very low levels of trust. Um, it's better for a society to have high levels of trust. But once you have like relatively high levels of trust, other issues might become more salient in getting you to go out and vote, other than just simply thinking that your government is responsive to your needs. Okay, thank you both. We've already gone uh, uh, two or three minutes over time. So I uh, will have to cut it short here. Great talking to you both. Thanks for these, this really interesting results that you found here. And uh, I hope we'll get you involved in future discussions with, with the previous workshop. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much.